Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today is the first episode in a two-part series where we're talking about aging and how words matter. I'm joined by Dr. Patricia D'Antonio. So welcome, Patricia. Melissa, thanks so much for having me. It's um, a pleasure to um, represent uh, the Reframing Aging Initiative on the call today. So maybe before we begin, you can just give me, just introduce yourself to us and kind of tell us how you ended up in this line of work, and then we'll dive into the Reframing Aging, Aging Initiative. So um, I serve as Vice President of Policy and Professional Affairs for the Gerontological Society of America. Um, GSA is a professional membership organization. Our members are um, conducting research in aging. Um, they're teaching at the university level um, about aging. Um, and we work to translate that research into um, good evidence-based policy and practice. Um, I have been with uh, GSA for roughly six years. I'm a board certified geriatric pharmacist by training and I've worked in um, aging most of my career. Um, so uh, this project, the Reframing Aging Initiative, um, I was, um, as part of my role in professional affairs, was asked to lead this um, initiative uh, on behalf of 10 aging, national aging organizations. Um, and we can get into the details um, in a couple minutes about those aging organizations and how the project came about. Okay. So for people who aren't familiar with the Reframing Aging Initiative, why was it even an important thing to do at all? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm not sure that we all realize is how um, ageism impacts so much in our in our lives, right? And so, um, when I uh, talk about ageism today, I'm talking about it from the perspective of you know any any time that we make um, generalizations or we um, have uh, biases about anyone at any age, um, we're talking about ageism. But in particular, we're talking about issues for older people. Um, in this project. And, and one of the things, or a couple of the things that I think people don't realize is how ageism impacts our health. This is one area where we have seen that, you know, one in every $7 spent in healthcare, which roughly equates to $63 billion a year is spent um, as a result of ageism. So is that we did not treat someone for um, a specific diagnosis, perhaps cancer, solely based on their chronological age. So solely based on the fact that someone's 72 years old, not taking into account um, their function, right? So how they, how they, are, um, how they are doing in, in, in the world. Um, so, you know, that really can have an impact. We see it not only in just in general, um, we see, um, issues where people have their own biases, right? Our own internalized biases about aging. And, and you know, as a pharmacist, and, and I know you as a, as a nurse, you know, we might hear people say, oh, I have this pain in my back. It must be because I'm getting old. And I often talk to people about, okay, I believe you that you have a pain in your back. I believe you that you are getting older, right? You are aging. Uh, and I, I do not believe that the sole reason that you have this pain in your back is because you're old, right? So right. it's important for you to get to your healthcare professional and get it checked out, right? So it's got, it, you know, some of the some of the things that we just assume because I'm getting old, this is this is why, um, you know, I, I have this healthcare condition, and that's not solely your um, the number of birthdays that you've celebrated that impact that, right? And we know that, but in the public. Um, not sure that people think about it that way every day. Self-ageism, either delaying care or um, not allowing you to get the care that you need because of self-imposed ageism. Right, right. And so, so it's pervasive. It's not, it's not just um, society puts it on us. We all put it on ourselves as well. So that's how um, the, the, the concept started. And um, really what happened was some of them, um, National aging organizations, some of the executive directors started to think about, you know, what is it that really holds us all back in, you know, in common? So when I'm talking about the national organizations, it, you know, in addition to the Gerontological Society, it was the American Federation on Aging Research, AARP, um, the National Council on Aging, American Geriatric Society, American Society on Aging, 
leading age. Um, there's 10 organizations, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, um, N4A, which is the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Um, when, when those executive directors got together, they were, you know, what is it that's holding us all back? And ageism is the one piece and, and, and it holds us back in policy, right? How do we get people to understand the importance of supporting policies that, that benefit us all as we age? And so they, they thought about that. And um, with a, a research partner, the Frameworks Institute um, decided to, you know, what's that research that we need to know? We really need to know how is ageism impacting us? Um, and conducted research to find out what does the public thinking about aging? What do experts in aging in the aging field think about it? And really start to compare that and see what can we do to change the narrative? So when I describe reframing aging to people, I say we're a long-term culture change initiative. It's grant funded and um, it truly is long-term because we're trying to change culture, really trying to think about how people um, understand aging, how people understand the contributions of older people and how they understand aging in society, right? Because we're all aging, right? I mean, that's the thing to think about, we're all aging. Um, right. And so that's how, how it got started. Um, the research was conducted um, in 2013, 2014. And then we really started to, uh, with our work in around 2017 and 2018, roll this out and, and, and learn, take our learnings and, and teach people about what this communication strategy should be and how you could apply it. Yeah, I think most people don't recognize ageism as a problem at all. I mean, it's really the only ism that's you know, socially accepted um, and it's actually self-imposed of all of the isms. And it's the only one that we're all doing together. And so um, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the different things that you, that came out kind of in the research? Sure. And, and you know, you, you raise um, the most important point here is how people do not recognize ageism, right? And that, it, and so we, um, in conducting the research, um, we map the gaps, you know, what do the experts think and what does the public think, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first point that you make is that uh, people don't think about ageism because we don't think aging is just part of us and we don't think about that. Um, so where experts might think that aging is something we embrace, right? We, um, working in aging, right? I mean, I'm always thinking the positive about um, what we can do. Um, the public tends to push aging away. Um, and what's really interesting is um, we, we have interviews with, with um, people um, as part of the research base. And you actually see people in, in the interview when you ask them questions about aging, you actually see them push away. Um, so it's not just the verbal cues, it's the nonverbal cues as well about aging that we need to think about. And um, the other thing that I think is really important there is when we uh, think about the anti-aging um, messages that we hear with uh, cosmetics, right? So, you know, people are trying to fight. We battle aging, right? We, talk, we use terms like that in the public. Um, and, and that really impacts us when we think about how, um, how the public will think about aging. And the one place that I always say that um, you can really make a difference is think about when you buy birthday cards, right? And we make fun of aging. And um, when I give uh, presentations, I have um, some of my colleagues and I, we have some slides about birthday cards and showing people really what it is. And every day, how many times do we buy birthday cards that make fun, make fun of age, right? You know, you're over the hill. Um, that some of our colleagues have uh, developed birthday cards that are age friendly now. And so it's important to think about that when you're purchasing birthday cards. Right. And I think, you know, ageism is actually the most inclusive of all the isms, like you know your gender, <laughs> you know your race, and those things make you different from other people. But ageism, you know, it kind of pitches this dichotomy of like, well, we are all aging. This could be an inclusive experience for all of us, but I'm not aging, they are. So maybe talk a little bit about the us-them dichotomy yeah. um, that you might've seen. 
So great points. Um, one is to remember that we experience isms in an intersectional kind of way, right? So people are not experiencing one ism at a time, right? So we know that you can be experiencing and we recognize the intersectionality uh, of, of, um, of the isms, right? So um, you can experience some uh, others as you're experiencing ageism at the same time. Um, I think what we learned in our research is there are, are challenges in, in, in how people, how the public thinks uh, around aging. Uh, some of that comes around that us versus them, right? Othering, right? So right. I'm not aging, you're aging, right? That, right. That, you I'm know, not old, you are. I'm not old, they're old, right? right. And so, um, you know, how old is old? 10 years older than me, right? That's, that's right. the I mean, answer but you, you, yeah. you, you can make, anyway. yeah. You can meet 75 year olds who are like in assisted living. They're like, I'm not old. I'm like the kid here. You know, these 85 year olds, those are the old people. And then you go talk to the 85 year olds. They're like, we're not old. The 95 year olds are old. So right. um, and that's, we, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. We, we, you know, we saw that in, in our research, right? Us versus them is really a challenge. And, and it's not only um, the challenge within, um, maybe groups that we think are, old, you know, when we're thinking about 60 and over. And, and this is what's really important, right? This is a communication strategy, right? So I, I, at the end of this podcast, I'm not gonna give you the slogan that everybody can use and poof, ageism is, is no longer. Um, but really when we do start to tell stories that create that us versus them, um, that othering, it, it does pit people and make um, make people think that we cue different models in our brains and, and the quick way that we start to think about this really um, starts to impede how we think about support for aging um, in, in any way. Um, so us versus them, um, some other ways that we think about, you know, people have an incomplete view of aging. So there's this dichotomy of everybody's on a cruise, right? That life of earned leisure, um, or somebody's jumping out of the airplane, uh, out of an airplane, or everybody is very sick and and decrepit and in, and and can't frail. function. They need help. They they're frail. They need help with whatever whatever is going to happen. And so you know those kind of pictures really don't um, help us in gaining support and gaining understanding of what aging means and how we all contribute in society at, even as we age, right? So um, that those pieces are really the um, pieces that we try to teach um, about how to cue um, more productive models to think about aging. Um, but the research certainly shows that the dominant models um, that, that we think about um, are things like us versus them. Um, you know, so almost like a zero sum game. We can't support this in, in for older adults because if we do, then children don't benefit. So that product, that kind of thinking is not productive for any way to be able to um, recognize um, the support that we need for all of us as we age. Right, and I think that from what I have found that kind of the negative thinking about aging is kind of the, the go-to of where people start with, you know, when you're, when you're talking about the frail elder versus, you know, the one leisure, living a leisure, a life of leisure. But, you know, to talk a little bit about kind of the impact of society with individualism and how that kind of feeds in to ageism. That, that's a really good point. And what we learned um, in our research is quite often you'll hear uh, a story about, you know, a good example of individualism is when um, somebody says something like, well, if you just exercise and eat right, you'll age well, right? And we hear, how many times do we hear that? Except we really need to think about what are the systems around us that make sure that we have that opportunity to eat well and, 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 and exercise, right? So if I, um, we think about, we talk about social determinants of health, right? If I grew up in a neighborhood where there are no grocery stores, 
um, or I have to take, and, and I live in the DC area, right, as, as you do. So you know that there are some people that have to take a Metro and two buses to get to a, 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 a grocery store. Or if I live in an area where I only have access to fast food restaurants, not necessarily the sit down restaurant um, where I can get some vegetables, right? Where I can get um, access to some healthier foods. Then just saying, if you only ate well, doesn't get you to that systemic solution that we need to create. Um, another place where that's important to think about is when people talk about financial planning, right? So when you're retiring, well, if you only just put money away every month, you would have money for when you, you know, when you retire. Well, if I am in a system where I'm working three jobs to make ends meet, um, I may not be in the position right now to be able to save for retirement. So what solutions? So it doesn't, it doesn't absolve people from having to take some actions. But what it does say is recognize that, um, you know, what surrounds us shapes us, right? And so we need, to, we need to ensure that there are policies in place that support all of us as we age. So supporting us in our younger years definitely impacts us in our older years, right? So, so those are some of the things that I think are really important to think about when we, you know, we cue those non-productive models or those negative models in our, in our head that are those shortcuts to get us something. And right, so with, with the Frameworks Institute, it was kind of defining all of these different ways of thinking that all of us experience, comparing kind of how right. experts thought about things compared to the public and you, how that thinking impacts the policies that we make for these systems rather than blaming individuals you know, for not meeting the mark of aging well. Mm -hmm. I do think some of that comes you know, from this concept of fatalism. So why don't you explain what fatalism is and kind of how that plays into how people think about things. So it's hard. Um, so I smile at this one because I, I'm guilty of this as well. And I, um, working in aging as long as we have, um, I had the perfect slide that had the tsunami, and I talked about the silver tsunami. Yeah. All the time. yeah. And I'm guilty I, of it. You know, too. that's not anymore. You know, <laughs> I feel horrible that I was contributing to, you know, the 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 culture that makes people think, well, if if this is a tsunami, I'm going to run someplace. I'm, I'm getting out of here. And, and really what we learn is in, in, those, in those fatalistic crisis kind of messages, which when you work in policy, right, the, the talk is you have to make it a crisis so that anybody, so anybody will take action. But, but honestly, what we learn through the research is people say, there's no solution here, so I'm going to go someplace else. And so when we talk or about the tsunami as much, it, it really does make people look in a different, like, let's go someplace else where we can make a difference. Well, the, the phrase I, t I tend to use is when you don't know what to do, you tend to do nothing. And so then nothing changes. And so, you know, aging is not all pessimistic. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, and so helping people make that jump from, well, there's nothing that can be done to showing them some of these opportunities. So what are some of the things that we can activate in communication that might help that? I think a couple of them, and, and hopefully um, you can hear me model some of those when we speak, right? And that's really what this is gonna be. And that's why it's long-term. Um, you know, we learned through our research that um, you know, frameworks tested some values. What are those values that you can cue for people um, that, that move the needle on how the public thinks about aging. And so um, this helps us think about how we can tell the story to be sure that we're not just telling any story, we're telling this effective narrative that, that can move the needle on how people think about aging. And so some of those, those um, cues that we want to, that are, that are harder to, they are harder to cue, right? Because they're, they're um, what they call recessive um, cultural models or recessive um, cognitive uh, models that we think about. So one is that you know problems can be solved, right? We we all believe that that problems can be solved, and and, and that comes out in a value of um, ingenuity. Um, it comes out in the way that we build momentum, right? In the United States, we put people on the moon, right? So 
we can solve problems when it comes time to having to think about that. Um, also that we have a collective responsibility when we cue that, right? So if you think about, um, you know, in society, we have a collective responsibility for, for all, right? So often you hear me talking about, when, when you hear me speak, I'll talk about the benefits us all as we age. Um, that's really something that um, we want to try and get across. And, and, you know, opportunities for intergenerational um, interaction, right? So we, we see schools now where how, how do we have um, older people involved in um, pre-K and K and, and kindergarten programs, right? Um, how are um, people of all ages attending university again, right? So when we see age-friendly movements, one of them is around universities, right? Recognizing that, um, you know, you have an opportunity for a second, third career, you're gonna go back to the university um, that intergenerational opportunity there of, of people interacting and, and that experience and knowledge that can be transferred is so important. And then what surrounds us shapes us. So that gets back to, again, what, what's in our community helps us to recognize that, that we're all responsible for, for, for all of us um, as, we, as we age. So, you know, when I was talking about some of the social determinants of health when we, when we think about those, um, do we have transportation? Do we have um, access to um, grocery stores? Things like that. that. That shapes us as we all age. So those are kind of the positive pieces that we wanna, that we wanna cue. So, you know, we talk about this in terms of values, right? So I mentioned earlier about the value of ingenuity and, and you know, that we can address um, any problem, right? We, we can solve it. We can solve it if we put our minds to it. You know, the other, the other thing is the value of justice, right? In our society, we should treat older people as equals, right? And we believe in that inherently in, in our society, right? It's even in our in liberty and justice for all, right? And so if you think about that. Um, it's, it's ingrained in us. And when we cue those types of values in our messages, and we explain that, and we offer solutions, you really can start to see the change that you need to have for people to start thinking differently and talking differently about aging. Thank you for joining me for part one of this discussion on aging and how words matter. I hope you'll tune in to next week's episode where we'll continue this conversation talking about reframing aging and why it matters. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out. In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.